Wave is going to be the topic of this lesson in my new general physics playlist, which when complete will cover a full year of university algebra-based physics. Now in this lesson, we're going to talk about the two major types of waves, transverse and longitudinal. We'll talk about the relationship between wave speed, frequency, and wavelength. We'll talk about the wave speed of a wave on a string. Uh, and then we'll talk about wave interference, both constructive and destructive. My name is Chad, and welcome to Chad's Prep where my goal is to take the stress out of learning science. Now, if you're new to the channel, we've got comprehensive playlists for general chemistry, organic chemistry, general physics, and high school chemistry. And on chadsprep.com, you'll find premium master courses for the same that include study guides and a ton of practice. You'll also find comprehensive prep courses for the DAT, the MCAT, and the OAT. So the typical wave that we're going to encounter in this chapter is going to require a medium in which to be propagated. So if we talk about a wave on a string, the string is the medium. If we talk about an ocean wave, the ocean water is the medium. If we talk about sound waves bouncing off the walls in this room as I talk, it's going to be the air in this room that is propagating that wave. Now sound, it turns out, can be propagated by a solid, a liquid, or a gas, but it does require a medium, which is why you can't hear sound in outer space when you're surrounded by just simply empty space. Now it turns out that light's gonna be the lone exception. Light has wave-like characteristics, but it doesn't require a medium in which to be propagated. Light can be propagated right through empty space. So when early astronomers knew this, they knew that you know, light from the sun was reaching the earth, or light was being reflected from the moon and reaching the earth, and every other wave they were familiar with required a medium, so they figured, well, there just must be some medium out in outer space. And they just said that outer space is full of the ether. And they didn't really know what it was, they just kind of coined it, figuring it had to be there. Well, it turns out they were wrong. Light is the lone exception here. It does not need a medium in which to propagate. But all the waves we will encounter in this chapter will. So, uh, and that's really gonna be, uh, the medium is gonna be involved in the major difference between the two major types of waves, transverse waves and longitudinal waves. So in a transverse wave, and this is gonna be more classically what you think of when you think of a wave, the medium is being displaced in a direction perpendicular to the propagation of the wave. And so pull out our handy dandy prop here. And if I give, I'm gonna keep this end over here fixed. So, and it's the other end that I'm gonna give one good oscillation here. Just give it like that. And you see the wave kind of going back and forth. So, and the big thing is that the slinky was being displaced up and down, up and down, even though the wave was traveling this way and that way. And that's what makes it a transverse wave is the displacement of the medium is in the direction perpendicular to the direction the wave is traveling. Now, if we take a look at a longitudinal wave, a little bit different. In sound, it turns out as a longitudinal wave, and we'll study that in the next chapter, but we can also demonstrate that with this slinky here as well, and we'll stretch it out a little bit. And in this case, instead of oscillating up and down like we did with the longitudinal wave, so in this case, I'm gonna give a good oscillation in the direction of the traveling wave, right, right along parallel to the slinky. And you can see it kind of going back and forth, back and forth. And what you're finding is it being compressed in areas and stretched in other areas. So, and that's what we call a longitudinal wave, where the displacement of the medium is in the same direction, parallel at least, to the direction of the propagating wave. Now, if we talk about the anatomy of wave, it's going to be a little easier to see things like the wavelength for a transverse wave, a little more, something you're a little more comfortable with, more likely, and a little more familiar with. So, and if you see kind of the oscillation of that wave, so if you take like the initial point here to the analogous point here, you could see the wavelength lambda right there. But you could do the same thing if you went like trough to trough or peak to peak. Those are other ways of determining that, that wavelength as well. And then uh, how long it takes for the propagating wave to travel one wavelength, that's the period, and then the frequency is the inverse of that. But with the longitudinal wave, it's a little bit more difficult to see. And what you're gonna find is that you're gonna have areas of compression. Let's say these are the coils of the spring, and then you're gonna have areas where it gets a little more spread out and then more compression again and stuff like this. Let's see if we can get that better. And, which, and it's just gonna alternate down the medium. And so what you'll find is that if you go from the middle of the compression to the middle of the compression, you can get a wavelength. Or if you go to the middle of the rarefaction, we call it, to the middle of the next rarefaction, you can get a wavelength that way as well. So not quite as easy to identify as a wavelength uh, based on you know what we traditionally think of as a wave, but completely analogous. And we can still talk about wavelength, we can talk about frequency, and we can talk about the period of a wave uh, for these longitudinal waves as well. So now we just want to briefly talk about the relation between uh, the speed of a wave, i.e. wave speed, and its frequency and wavelength. And it's just simply equal to the product of the frequency and the wavelength. So you could say that the wave speed is proportional to the frequency and your wave speed is proportional to lambda, the wavelength there as well. So three variables in that equation. If you're provided with two, you can solve for the third. In fact, let's do that right now. So 
Question here says a wave on a string has a frequency of 10.0 hertz and a wavelength of 0.25 meters. What is the speed of the wave? And in this case, just simply plug in and chug in with that equation here. So V equals F times lambda. Frequency was given as 10.0 hertz. Recall that a hertz is a per second. So wavelength given is 0.25 meters. So and you can see multiplying the two, we're gonna get meters per second, which is the SI unit for speed here. And so your velocity here, so is just 2.5 meters per second. Okay, not a lot of super intensive calculations in this section, but we got one other equation and that is the velocity of a wave on a string. So and it turns out it's equal to the square root of the tension in the string divided by what's called the linear mass density of the string. And that linear mass density is equal to the mass of the string divided by the length of the string. So you can see it comes out in kilograms per meter, if you will. This is also gonna be another simple plug and chug. There's three variables in this equation. You're typically gonna be given two out of the three and asked to solve for the third. But you can see here that the velocity here is related to the tension in the string. As the tension in the string goes up, the velocity goes up. But it's not proportional. It's proportional to the square root of the tension. So if the tension goes up by a factor of four, the velocity only goes up by the square root of four, i.e. two. But you can see that also the velocity is inversely related to this linear mass density. As the linear mass density goes up, the velocity is gonna go down, but again, through the square root. And so if you make the linear mass density increase by a factor of four, the tension's gonna go down, but by the square root of four, i.e. again, going down by a factor of two, i.e. cut in half. Now, in this case, you might be given the linear mass density itself, or you might be given the overall mass and length of the entire string, and therefore asked to calculate kind of the linear mass density knowing those two and then substituting it back into this equation. So it could be given either way. All right, so question on the handout here with regard to this, as a string with a linear mass density, 3.0 times 10 to the minus four kilograms per meter is plucked, resulting in a wave with a wave speed of 430 meters per second. What is the tension in the string? So typically encounter this kind of a thing, uh, thinking about like a guitar string or the strings inside of a, a piano box or something like that. So let's do some plugging and chugging. So in this case, we want to actually solve for the tension, the linear mass density and velocity were supplied. So we're going to have to square both sides. So in this case, we're going to be left with V squared equals T over mu. And so if we look, we'll multiply both sides by mu and we're going to get T equals V squared times mu. And from here, it's just plugging and chugging. Velocity is given us 430 meters per second. So linear mass density 3.0 times 10 to the negative four kilograms per meter. And we'll let our calculator do the heavy lifting from here. So in this case, 430 squared times three times 10 to the negative four. We're gonna get 55.47. We need two sig figs. So that's gonna round down to 55. And tension is a force that should be in Newtons, we can verify that. So we're gonna have meters squared over seconds squared times kilograms over meters. So it's gonna cancel out one of the meters. So we have kilograms, meters per second squared, which indeed is a Newton. So the last topic we'll cover in this lesson uh, is wave interference. And there's gonna be constructive interference on one hand and destructive interference on the other hand. And the idea is that you're gonna have overlapping waves and ultimately you're gonna add the displacements at every point together uh, and that's what we call the superposition principle. So when two waves overlap, just add the displacements at every location in space together to get the resulting wave between the two. Now in constructive interference, this is gonna lead to larger amplitude waves and in destructive interference, this is gonna lead to smaller amplitude waves. Now here I've got two identical waves. It doesn't have to be two identical waves, but that's the example I'm gonna take here. And in this case, the positive regions line up perfectly, the negative regions line up perfectly, the node in the middle where the wave function is zero line up perfectly. Uh, and what you're gonna find is this is gonna be purely additive. If we look at specifically the peaks, here you've got the, the full amplitude and here the full amplitude. If you add those together, you're gonna get double the amplitude. And so the resulting wave, the way it would look, would look as something with double the amplitude. So it's gonna have the same frequency and wavelength. The node's gonna be in exactly the same place but ultimately you're just taking the analogous points at any point in space here. You could take this point and this point, and it's gonna reach a point that's twice as tall as either one of these was on the original axes and stuff like this. 
Cool, now when they line up perfectly, the positive region with positive, negative with negative, node with node, we say that these are in phase. Now in contrast here, I'm gonna take again two identical waves, at least they have the same amplitude, but now we're gonna find out that the positive region of one lines up exactly with the negative region of the other. The node still lines up, but now the negative region of the one lines up with the positive region of the other. And if we use the superposition principle, we can see that, well, here we have an amplitude of A, here a negative A. Well, if I add A and negative A, then at that point in space, the wave function is gonna have, you know, the combined wave function, if you will, is gonna be zero. Well, it turns out that's out of every point in space. If I add zero with zero, I'm still gonna get zero. So if I add this point with this point, this one's just as positive as this one is negative and adding them together is still gonna get zero. Now, when you have two identical wave functions here, uh, and we say they're exactly out of phase, and specifically we actually get a little more specific, we say 180 degrees out of phase, as out of phase as they could possibly be. Well, if they had the same amplitude, the result is gonna be nothing. The overall, uh, the overlapping wave function, if you will, is just gonna be zero as a result. Now again, I chose it to be 180 degrees out of phase. I chose two functions that have exactly the same amplitude. You know, if this one had double the amplitude as this one, so I would still get a resulting wave function. So, but again, I would still get it from the result of adding every point in space between the two and it would be smaller than the original. What you'll find is that with constructive interference, the resulting overlapping wave is bigger than the original waves. And with destructive, it tends to be smaller than the original waves. And in this case, with it being 180 degrees, again, out of phase, with the same amplitude, it adds up to exactly nothing. But again, these are the extremes. You can get everything in between. So you just kind of know which side of the equation you're on is if the over overlapping wave got larger or the overlapping wave got smaller. It doesn't actually have to go to zero. It just has to get smaller. And that's when you've got destructive interference taking place. If you found this lesson helpful, consider giving it a like. Happy studying.